Hello and welcome to today's webinar. This is part of our digital building series of online events held today. I'm Chloe McCulloch, Buildings Editor, and this webinar is titled Productivity Crunch, How Can Construction Tackle Inflationary Pressures? And I'm joined with a brilliant panel who you can see on your screens now. So we have Simon Rawlinson, Head of Strategic Research Consultant Arcadis. He also is very involved in the Construction Leadership Council. So at times in this webinar, he might talk with that hat on as well. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Simon. Uh, we have Laura welcome Collins. <laughs> Great. We also have uh, Laura Collins, Project Director at Developer Stanhope. And Rachel Houlihan, Sustainability Coordinator at Architect Practice Orms. So welcome all. It's brilliant to have you here. I'm just going to give a, a lay out a few introductory words just on our topic, uh, just while we have the audience joining us. Um, so really, I think this is a very timely topic, really, isn't it? So materials and labour shortages have been a feature of UK construction uh, for a long while, but particularly um, since we've seen the post-COVID bounce back in activity and some of kind of question whether that's going to put at risk some of our ambitions to build back better as a route to recovery. So we saw that, you know, quite early on. Um, but then since then, we've had Russia invading Ukraine. Um, and that's almost exactly two months ago now that that happened. Seems a lot longer. Um, but the as well as the awful human cost of the war, um, we also, of course, know that there have been huge repercussions for the glo global economy. Uh, with all the impacts that we've seen on oil and gas and commodity prices. So I think it was about a month ago, the OBR uh, forecast that inflation could average 7.4% this year. I think they put that as a 40-year high. And then just this week, we've had the IMF warn that the war in Ukraine could hamper global recovery. And also, worryingly, saying that it could hit the UK harder than most forecasting that growth in this country in 2023 could be the slowest out of the G7 at just 1.2%, with inflation at, uh, among the highest amongst that group. So those are kind of worrying background noises and warnings that we're having. And clearly, there's not a huge amount that construction firms individually can do about these external pressures. But there are some things companies do control. Um, and high up on that list is helping the industry to tackle long-term problems around low productivity and low productivity growth. And I think that's where Simon, Rachel and Laura are going to come in. And they're going to be talking about different parts of the supply chain and what they can do to improve processes around new tech, new approaches and new ideas, really, to get around these problems of labour and material shortages and other and other challenges that the construction sector has. So um, they each have very different perspectives. So I think this promises to be a really interesting discussion. Before we get stuck in, uh, just a bit of housekeeping um, before all of our speakers uh, present. So a reminder that you as the audience, we really want you to post your questions throughout the webinar. I'll see those questions pop up and I'll, I'll note them and then we can come back at the end when everyone's presented and have a sort of general Q&A session. So please do post your questions as thoughts uh, um, are triggered for you um, and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. Um, and then finally, a, a very common question is, will this webinar be available later? Yes, it will. Uh, so it's recorded and then I think about an hour after we finish, it will be available on our website. So if you've missed any bits or you've got any colleagues who you'd like to share it with, then it will be available. Do come back to our website. So I think that's quite enough for me. I can see our audience is gathering. So I'm going to hand over to Simon first. Uh, the rest of us are going to turn off our webcams and our mics. And uh, Simon hopefully should have presenter control and he can display some slides for you all. Right. Thank you, Chloe. And uh, hopefully everybody can see my slide. So um, I'm briefly going to talk about uh, the productivity crunch. I have to say I, I do these presentations probably every um, so five or six years. And I distinctly remember using some of the slides that I'm going to show uh, in a moment um, around 2008. And sadly, a lot of the trends that I'm going to talk about haven't changed. 
Um, so the first one, I think, is just to remind ourselves of the, the, the quite horrific nature. Firstly, the productivity crunch for the UK economy as a whole, uh, but for construction in particular. So this little graph, which I sort of grabbed off the ONS last night, going all the way back to 1997, then you can see there that actually the UK economy has a productivity problem. It's flatlined uh, pretty much for that 25 years. You can see construction has done even worse, uh, which is pretty terrifying. Uh, and then the, the real concern then, of course, is if you think about where the, the, re, the new economy is focused, technology manufacturing, for example, there are an enormous um, uh, gains in productivity. And a lot of that is through digitization, through actually the fact that sort of like electronic components have so much greater capacity for processing than they might have had a few years. And construction sadly can't take any benefit from the Moore's law, for example. Uh, and increasingly, it's not going to be able to take much benefit from globalization either. So this is a homegrown problem uh, that we need to focus on ourselves. And you see that pattern there that no construction productivity growth in 25 years, but costs have gone up by 95%. And the way that I'd articulate that is that actually this problem is not our problem, it's everyone's problem. So everyone who's a client, anybody who uses transport infrastructure, health infrastructure and such like, is paying an unnecessary additional cost because construction is not as productive as it could be. So I'm going to briefly think about some of the areas which we should be thinking about uh, when considering improving productivity and thinking about them in the broadest sense. So I, I sort of like thought about this and when you when you initially think about productivity, often you think about, oh, we must go down the manufacturing route. So we must become like the sort of car manufacturers. So that takes us to the MMC route, which I think is described as being at the apex of productivity. But there's a whole lot of other stuff around waste reduction, rationalization of process, which it's fair to say the industry has been talking about for as long as I've been in the industry, which is a while, and it still doesn't necessarily do very much about it. Now, there's one great position which we find ourselves in now, uh, which we might not have done in previous crises, in that the industry has actually been investing in quite a lot of sort of you know, pilot projects and such like through the construction sector deal and the transforming construction challenge. And so there's a lot more thinking and a lot more tools and devices out there um, that we can use. And I'd encourage everybody to go on the website. This is part of the UKRI's funded program to have a look at some of these projects because they really do um, sort of uh, map out different ways of generating productivity improvements across the business. Now, so what I'm going to do is just look through those three elements of my um, productivity hierarchy, stopping at the bottom, the area where it's most easy to sort of like get improvements, and, and then move up through that hierarchy. So waste. Uh, and I have to say, it's so common in the industry, you know, the skip that we see, the people standing around not doing what they should be doing, perhaps people working on top of one another. It's so common that, to be quite honestly, we no longer see it. We are, we are normalized to it. So the areas where I think we can start to do work are, for example, looking at some damaged components. So how do you start to protect stuff before it gets on site? So thinking about how we manage sites better. The classic one around excessive specifications, we see that in Arcadis through the high costs in the International Construction Cost Index, which was recently issued. UK is always towards the top. Why is that? Classic ones around avoiding rework. I think the, the Get It Right initiative that's saying that something like 20 to 25 percent of, of the time spent on site is fixing problems which were created on site rather than uh, rather than actually doing uh, constructive new work. And any unnecessary activities that we do, and that's in the professions, in terms of sometimes some man marking, it's in terms of people being asked to sort of move around sites unaffect, un, 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 unproductively and such like. So they, we don't really organize ourselves in an effective way. So lots of opportunity there. And from a perspective of the transforming construction uh, challenge, uh, a few great things are doing. This one, BIM formed active learning engines of like encouraging people to use online tools to sort of learn about where issues might be arising around some defects. 
uh, another one around automated monitoring of activity on site so you're not having to have people doing this so you can see lots of things where automated recognition of plant and such like so lots of things that start to take some human activity and materials out of the construction project so great opportunities there from a point of view of rationalization uh, i often think about construction as, as being a sort of as being an industry that doesn't really think about the resources that we use as being scarce and precious. So if you think about some of the, the, the things that we celebrate most are, are often about some like the handcrafts, the, 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 the precision, the fantastic detail that an individual put, will put into a piece of work. And we don't celebrate that with cars or smartwatches. We celebrate with that, the sort of like the automation, the technology and such like. And I think a lot more application of that sort of rational process is really important. And I tried to get an image of a rational process for construction for this presentation to be quite honest, a confined one. So I used an image of a logistics center, which is effectively, it sums up rational pro pro um, processes, standardization and such like. Everybody understands it, but we struggle to apply it to a construction. So a few examples here. Uh, buildability, we used to talk about an awful lot. And now I think what we seem to be talking about, again, is, is greater complexity. I've got some colleagues who recently described to me an external wall solution uh, on a housing project as being corduroy in brick. And that was going to be handset brick rather than machine um, manufactured uh, panels. So they we're almost like encouraging complexity in the work which we do. Process automation by consultants as well as by uh, contractors. Arcadis has got robotized uh, processes in some of our reporting now, so we can sort of minimize the effort that we put into these things. And some great real-time optimization technologies to enable people to make better use of, of projects, uh, improve logistics and such like. And again, the TTC examples, one here, which is an Aquila, a tool which is used to uh, optimize plant on site to make sure that it effectively um, it's, it concentrates efforts on site, the right place at the right time, minimize movements around sites and such like to achieve the output that's needed. Another one uh, developed by Mason Imperial Colleges, they call the AEC production control room. So it's almost the idea of a, of a sort of NASA mission control a sort of room where all the data that you need to manage a project is presented in one place to enable again sort of the team to work most effectively to, to deliver the best results. And finally, everybody knows what MMC is, uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, uh, but I will emphasize that this should be the probably the last place to look for productivity rather than the first. Uh, and we also should be thinking about it's not just what you might describe the standard solution, the pods, it's about standard products as well. And uh, I know that Stanhope, for example, have been using standardized products really effectively for many years. Of all, uh, uh, many years. And finally, this, this idea of scale, creating an, an investable industry so you attract more people to get involved. And I'm not going to give examples here because there are plenty of them. But what I do want to remind people of is that that sense of there are levels of off-site sort of um, off-site rationalization, which goes from the sort of like the pods at the top, level one, right down to rationalized site processes at level seven. So the sense we can apply these at different levels within a project as suits the, 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 the requirements and the opportunities that arrive there. So it's not a one size fits all solution. So finally wrapping up, I think just remind ourselves we should treat resources as scarce and precious. So think about them as being water in a desert rather than stuff which we don't necessarily really think about when we design, when we procure. Then I think we need to plan much better than we, we might do. So, you know, really be really clear about how we can how we can sort of optimize the use of the resources, materials and labor. And then finally, I think we need to do much more around measurement, management and benchmarking the use of those resources as well as benchmarking the outturn costs and such like. So that's my thoughts. I'm now going to pass on to Laura and uh, we'll see how we come back at the Q&A. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you so much. So I just want to intervene there quickly and just uh, just uh, pick up on it. one thing where um, just so we don't forget uh, one of the slides that you had 
I thought that first slide that you had that had the 95% increase in costs going up from was it 1997 so in my <clears throat> info I was talking about very recent history of a, a spike but it shows a longer term trend in cost increases why is yeah. that what why why do you um, have that so, I mean, I think there's one thing is I mentioned globalization and um, we've had a low inflation economy generally. And a lot of that has been because um, products have been imported very low cost from, say, for example, China, Asia. Uh, we also increasingly have uh, an economy that's dominated by aspects of technology. So, as you saw, huge increase in productivity and in in various aspects of those industries so so and again construction doesn't really benefit from those and i think ultimately uh, we we have to manufacture a lot of very basic goods and then assemble them on site using people uh, and that that is a is is a very difficult industry to make more productive but we haven't helped ourselves by not really adopting manufacturing disciplines both in the way that we design projects, we use components, and then we operate on site. And I think there's, so there's, there's something almost like treating construction as a special case, does what it's always done. And that's one of the reasons why productivity hasn't improved as much as it should have done. Right, okay. I just thought it was important to have that sort of bigger picture thing when we're talking yeah. about these <clears throat> underlying trends. Brilliant, thank you. Well, look, there's so much in that presentation that I'm sure we can unpack in the, um, the Q and A. So I'm going to hand over to Laura now. Um, uh, brilliant. I'm going to. Good morning. Goals. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. I hope everyone's doing okay and had a good Easter break. Um, I'm Laura Collins. I've got over 15 years um, experience in the industry and um, I was lucky enough to join Stanhope in November 2019. And for those who are unfamiliar with the Stanhope brand, we take projects from land acquisition right the way through to management of the asset. And we have around a team of 100 people working out of our London office. But we also have um, master plans in both Manchester and Oxford, um, so we're not just London based. We have um, been delivering over 30 million square feet and over 30 billion pounds of end value to our investors. And in one year, we typically manage around three billion pounds worth of construction value on site. Um, across a team of around 20 project directors. So although we're small, we do seem to have a big impact in the industry. I'm currently responsible for leading um, the Warwick Hall refurbishment project and eight Bishopsgate project in London, and that's on behalf of our investors, Mitsubishi Estates. Um, they're very two di very different projects. One's a refurbishment and the other one is a new city tower. So it's quite interesting to see the differences between them. First of all, I'd just like to congratulate on everyone on getting through a really difficult three years. Um, when I first joined Stanhope in November 2019, um, I, there was no way of predicting of all the major events that have happened in the industry since. And I think sometimes we do need to kind of step back and reflect and congratulate ourselves on, on what has been a difficult period, but we've got through it. And we're now working in a completely different way and our industry needs to adapt and stay agile. Um, so now is a fantastic opportunity to really develop and leapfrog innovation um, and use technology um, to make sure that we're delivering excellence and that, that we can use technology and in, in reuse, rationalisation and waste. And I think that's what we've been doing in both projects that I'm working on at the moment. And as Simon previously discussed, we face further pressure in the year ahead, in the years ahead. And it is more important than ever to keep the industry moving and working in a collaborative way to make sure that our projects keep moving and are successful for our investors. We are facing challenges not only with inflation but ESG measures, um, fire issues and our tenants are continually changing um, their requirements and 
and asking for a more developed and enhanced product um, out of the asset. And whilst we would like to reuse everything when we come into a refurbishment situation, um, that the, the market unfortunately doesn't reflect that. And we come up against many issues um, when it comes to insurance and warranties that our tenants require. And our appraisals are needing to work even harder than ever to kind of adapt and obtain value to our investors and to make sure the asset is working as hard as possible. So what are we doing um, to make sure that we keep projects moving? So we are we are working our design teams harder and we're driving value out of the asset and bringing our construction teams earlier to discuss the methods of construction to make sure that our design aspirations can be achieved when it gets to construction and to drive efficiency out of the product and the project and hopefully that will alleviate some of the pressures that we continually face um, when we come to construction projects. And whilst we see the current conflict in Ukraine um, as a short-term impact, we are readying ourselves for what will be an, another incredibly busy time ahead in construction. And we don't see our pipeline slowing, so we need to work harder together to be able to achieve success. We need to be cautious about how we're reporting and fear-mongering is not the right attitude currently. Strategic thinking, upfront and honest conversations allow us to make a difference. And like Simon's presentation, this is everyone's problem and not just an individual co individual's company. Relationships and collaboration, Stern Hope Phil are the key to success even more so in today's market. We, we pride ourselves on the relationships that we have in the industry. And from design right the way through to construction, we need to be thinking of efficiencies and how we can continually improve. We have over 700 people on site at 8 Bishopsgate, and that's a lot of work we have to do in terms of logistics and efficiencies of labour. And through the construction uh, management group we're able to make sure that we can drive the efficiencies as best as we can. I am a strong believer that we all need to work as one team rather than silos um, companies and a common problem we come across are great ideas from uh, one, one company but then engaging our construction teams too late to implement them in the practice does, does become an issue. At Stanhope we are focusing on four main areas currently and the first being the value to the asset for both investors and tenants determining what's important and how the building will be used and it's important to remember that we're, we're in business to make money as well as everything else so we need to make sure that we are driving the best value out of the asset and most another important factor is ESG and that's not just in construction but how the long-term impact will be managed so we're really starting to um, collaborate with the asset management teams and the building management teams of the asset that will continue the journey of the project and the building's life um, and we don't believe in box ticking at Stanhope. So we're looking into what really does make the difference um, when we when we say that our buildings are net zero and it's not just an offsetting exercise. And we really do see our asset management teams having a key role in ensuring that buildings are performing to the design intent and it's fit for purpose when the asset requires um, refurbishment or reaches the end of its life in the future. And material availability and processes, um, like Simon mentioned, we need to enhance our use of technology and innovation and start, start having a look through our supply chains of where our materials are coming from and whether there's any efficiencies um, that we can make. And a, a big one that's talked about in the industry is how we attract people to our, our fantastic industry that we've got going. And, um, we work we're working tirelessly across our supply chain and with our relationships um to try and attract um labor to our uh, our workforce so just as a final note i just wanted to use this presentation as a bit of a um outline of my thoughts and i do welcome q a as we go through 
that when starting a project it's really important to understand what the client's drivers are and to keep them in mind throughout the process um, we don't need to reinvent the wheel on each project with construction the construction industry has been going for a very long time and i think it's safe to say that some mistakes are repeated on each project and we need to become more together and be more effective of delivering that and to keep the market moving um, so yeah i look forward to any questions that you may have but for now over back to rachel oh thanks Laura. just before okay. you go I, I i just wanted to pick your brains about eight bishops gate because it sounds so so interesting and it's one of your projects i think you said um you said you've got 700 people on site um and are there any as we're talking around efficiencies and productivity are there any specifics on that particular project that you would point to to say that that's been working really well on that project specifically yeah i think um logistically with, with a tower it's always quite difficult um because you've got lots of labor gangs across the across the um across the project so we've been really looking at um looking at kind of breaking the project down into even bite-sized chunks really to work out how we're going to tackle that particular area and how how we can make sure that people aren't up at the top top for half a day and then back down the bottom and just making sure that everyone's kind of clear and having that communication across the project and it's something that's working really well and all of the site team are based on site um, I'm down there twice twice a week at the moment as well so having that kind of relationship and the communication that we can kind of make decisions quickly as well really helps to keep the project moving and it's something um, with the kind of pandemic um, it became even more important um, to make sure that, that communication is really strong across that across the workforce so often I, I think what I'm hearing you say it isn't always down to having like a fancy bit of tech or something newly invented it's actually some quite basic organization and communication skills yeah 100 percent. i mean we've got some really clever stuff on site and we're actually making sure that we're we're reusing as much as we can and that there's the waste we're not waste wasting materials either and we've actually got mini production um lines set up throughout the tower to make sure that we're reusing as much as we can and um it's it's great really because we've got some innovation but we've actually got some like you say some really basic things of just making sure that people know what they're doing um and we well, we have regular kind of director walks and things to make sure that everyone is kind of bought in and it's everyone's success and not just not just Stanhope, not just mitsubishi but everybody um across the supply chain um that's kind of really striving for that project to be successful and it's making sure that people are bought into that idea and the dream really so not to put you on the spot but when when do you reckon you'll be done on site like what's what's the aim for completion yeah, yeah. <laughs> um this this year right okay so you're working pretty fast both projects yeah great great okay well look, i'm sure we'll hear more about that from you in due course um and on building's website no doubt Okay, we're going to move on to uh, Rachel at Orms now. Um, Rachel, can you bring up your webcam? Brilliant. Over to you. Thanks, Chloe. Um, so... Okay, hopefully you can see those slides now. Um, so... Okay, perfect. Uh, so my name is Rachel Houlihan. I am an architect and a sustainability coordinator at Orms Architects. Um, so we're a London-based architectural practice. Um, we largely work in the commercial sector, uh, delivering offices and um, hospitality projects in the UK. Um, and we work a lot with existing buildings. Um, we do have some new builds, but my role within the office is looking at the sustainability on our projects. And I'm heavily involved in sustainability research in the industry. Um, and what we've come to a conclusion, uh, like uh, Simon as well, is that to address the climate emergency, we believe that a circular economy is a necessity and not a choice. Um, and we were looking too at the waste um, statistics. So it's about two thirds of the UK's waste uh, comes from the CD and E industry. Um, and we have been producing a piece of research that aims to reduce the amount of waste being produced by construction by encouraging deconstruction and material reuse. Um, so 80% of the buildings that we 
um, will have in 2050 have already been built. So we know we can't just keep simply mining for new materials. So if we can reuse what we already have, then we're going to be able to reduce that demand for virgin materials and almost try and circumnavigate the issues that we're currently facing. So this concept um, starts with treating buildings as material banks. So what I mean by that is seeing a building as a repository or a stockpile of valuable high quality materials that can easily be taken apart and recovered. Um, and I picked up on a piece of research that was led by an EU funded group called BAM, and they were looking at how this might happen. And the fundamental principle is if you think of a building a building like um, building with Lego, you might have your existing building on the left hand side and instead of demolishing it and sending it for recycling or even to landfill, you actually deconstruct the building and catalog all of the elements you're taking out and you'll need to sort through them to decide what you might want to reuse in situ and maybe what you don't have any appropriate use for and you'll need to send for onward reuse. Now, unfortunately, we haven't been building with this in mind, so there are still going to be some materials that won't be suitable for reuse. But if we start thinking about this now with everything new that we're putting up, and we look closely at our existing buildings, and particularly our older buildings, um, where they may have been assembled without adhesives because we didn't have them, um, so it might be easier to take the materials apart and get them back out again. And then the idea is that you might source some additional materials and this would all come together to complete your building. Um, so key to unlocking this is knowing what you have and being able to organize that information. So this is um, material passporting. Uh, so here is a vision of the material passport. So you might have material. Um, there is a way of accessing the data. Here we're showing a QR code and the data that you start to collate you know, is up for a debate, but it will be key information that could de-risk the reuse of this material. Um, so looking at our own processes and um, trying to deal with the inefficiency in construction um, and making sure that our design process could be as efficient as possible. We've proposed a solution where we would start um, an external database, a cloud-based database, uh, which we could start to capture information about the existing materials in an existing building. And then the idea would be that during the design phase of the project, we could selectively import the data into our BIM models. Um, so we're not overloading them, we're working in an as efficient manner as possible. Uh, this isn't smooth sailing at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of tech bits and bobs that need to be resolved, but the ultimate goal is that if you're walking around a building, you'll be able to scan a material and you'll be able to bring up um, the information about that material, but even it could work on the other side. So you might just start by tagging an existing building and then starting to survey and add the data as you go. And when you scan the material what's popping up on maybe just your phone is actually access to that database that's sitting behind the passport. Um, so that's just one example of how we've been looking to research to try and innovate but um, in parallel we've been doing a piece on digitization and technology in the construction industry. Um, so we know that the industrial revolution uh, took about 200 years but was very disruptive and we also know that ICT took about 40 years and we're estimating that Digitech is going to take about 10 years but disruption is coming. And um, this is quite a nice graph from Richard Baldwin, which looks at the technology trigger and the, the progress of digital technology. So for a long time, we tend to overestimate the impact and we feel this is where we have been. Um, but we're about to reach what he terms the holy cow moment, where all of a sudden you realize the power and the potential of digital technology. Um, and it really will start to change how we're doing things. Uh, so we know that other industries have been very effective um, at using technology um, to innovate. So we've been looking to them and trying to translate the technologies into the problems that we're currently facing. Uh, so we had looked initially um, at the housing crisis, so looking at house building and how maybe technology uh, solutions could help us with this. So you already know what the problems are, but rising land and construction costs, reduction in small builders, which is actually quite important, um, and it just makes everything um, take much longer and also makes everything a lot more expensive. Um, so our approach is how can you know technology help us get around it? So if we can gather data through different softwares to help us collaborate in a better way, um, we can get a more informed design, um, a more resolved design, which then we can combine um, with other information to communicate more effectively with the people building our buildings. 
and the end goal being that all of the buildings can be much more efficiently built and then there is a cost benefit to this as well. Um, so we're working on a model of how we can combine 3D printing with automation and robotics to try and streamline this process and empower the local builder. And the local builder is really quite key to us in this. Um, so rather than having housing being provided by a main developer, um, we want to be able to give power back to the local builder um, to support the local economy. And by introducing direct engagement, we'll be able to cut out the middle man. So the um, ultimate goal is that the home owner will be able to have much greater influence in the design of their home and manage that process themselves. Um, and this isn't, you know, too far away. This is a 3D printed house, which was completed in Germany, I think, last year, uh, which is really quite beautiful. Um, so you could imagine if you have a plot of land, you go through the design process with your architectural team, which is maybe managed in a more efficient way. Um, and then you might be able to go and rent your 3D printer and purchase your um, materials and off you go, either as a self builder or with a local filter. Um, so in conclusion, we think that you know, these are two possibly very viable solutions to try and um, tackle the issues around uh, productivity and um, also with material uh, shortages um, and particularly you know, with um, 3D printing, it's a much leaner use of material as well. Um, it's not the only solution and I think that's really important. Um, you know, we're going to have to look everywhere to try and pull these ideas together, but we hope that in some way that this might be able to make an impact. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm just going to pick up on a couple of uh, points that you mentioned there, some really interesting ideas and research that you've, you've been um, involved with. Um, we've had some questions in from people around this idea of um, material passporting, and I guess people just wondering, how, I, I, lots of different questions, but I, I think underlying them all is, is, is it sounds like a huge task and mm -hmm. it sounds really complicated and really difficult and is it kind of is the effort worth it in the end and how much gain can you get i suppose have you, have you looked into that side of it yeah um so it is definitely in the early stages um for anyone who is interested we have published i was sharing some slides out of a larger brochure that we've um published so that's on our website if you go to orms and then go to insights you'll see the material passport work there um, and there's also a webinar where i'm presenting it so i explained it in a little bit more depth it's not perfect um, at the moment we're still uh, trialing it so i've been presenting to a lot of organizations and bringing together material passport working group um, so lots of different companies you know this idea we have to collaborate as an industry and um, so lots of other architectural practices engineering practices clients developers builders um, to try and push this forward together. At the moment, we have to start small because it is quite a manual process. But you know, you could imagine that perhaps the database could interface with, um, you know, MBS software where they have a database there. Um, it could perhaps interface with other databases that we might start to build in the UK. Um, then there's big questions around how do we manage this. Uh, so what role do, for example, local authorities hold or the GLA hold? Could they hold this sort of centralised database of information of what is in our buildings? Um, I think the true value is in de-risking the process. So if you take something as risky as, say, a fire door, if I leave it alone and we know that it's been maintained and the fire seals are checked appropriately, um, then that door can stay there indefinitely. As soon as I come in and I take it out because maybe we're taking down that wall, um, if I go to install it somewhere else in the building or if I offer it over to Laura for one of her projects, she's not going to touch it with a barge pole because it's risk. And so how do we deal with this? Well, data is key to that. So if I know who the manufacturer is, in theory, I could then say to her, well, it's such and such a door. Um, and here's the service history that went along with that door. And she's becoming more and more confident. But if you think even bigger than that, well, what if we're able to go back to that manufacturer and say, we have one of your doors and hopefully it's been designed in a way that it can be refurbished. And would you be willing to offer a small warranty with it um, with the reinstallation? So this is actually, you know, I'm presenting sort of the tip of the iceberg. This is a huge piece of work that we're doing um, sort of in conjunction with the UK Green Building Council's Circular Economy Programme. Um, so we've really been spending the last couple of years just putting together the lists of problems. <laughs> and now we're going out there and trying to convince everybody, all of the actors in the uh, value chain, not just the supply chain, but why we need to be thinking about 
designed for reuse, why we need to be looking at our existing products and figuring out if there's better ways of reusing. Because, you know, Laura mentioned she's, you know, trying to reuse as much as possible. It's not easy. Um, and I, I completely sympathize with that. It's not completely doable at the moment, but trying to pioneer and pilot through it, we think that it holds value and we're quite determined to get there um, and hopefully encouraging others to join us on this journey as well. I mean, it's probably an impossible question to ask, but how far off do you think we are? Like you said, we're early stages. Do you mm -hmm. give this kind of like a 10 year window or is it just impossible to say? I think it's fairly impossible to say, but I mean, our projects now in some way have a little bit of material passporting. So being strategic, you know, if you're going into an existing building, figure out what it is you're going to reuse and then start collecting information about that. At the moment, it's largely the structural elements. Um, if we're putting in new materials in a building, is there anything that holds huge reuse potential in the future? Let's capture that information now. So it's happening in a small scale. Whether we'll ever reach a point where it's of benefit to completely tag and label an entire building, I don't know. Um, but I'm not here to collect data for the sake of collecting data. So, um, you know, I sort of explain to people that you need to be very strategic about where you go with it. But I think it could be five years away. I think we have the power and the potential. It's just a case of um, how quickly we can move as an industry. OK, brilliant. Well, look, at that, that point, I'm going to bring in the others from our panel and um, I might actually just invite them uh, to uh, to share their views on just that last point that we've been talking around, um, you know, because it's, it's quite sort of innovative and interesting. Um, so um, I don't know, Simon, what are your thoughts on this, this idea around material passporting? Um, I, I mean, I, th I think it's established in other industries. So I'm to think automotive is is an area which I think has designed for recycling for many years uh, and that was driven to a large part by sort of regulation and such like um i i think that point about the the volume of stuff that goes to landfill again is a is a is a real problem for the industry and one which is going to become more and more significant i think if, if i was going to make an observation and i thought the fire door was a really good example of if you apply this kind of process selectively to where components are have the potential for reuse, then actually I think this works really well. I think if you try and do it across everything, then it gets rather more difficult. So I, I think that sense of being clear around which bits can be reused and creating the logic and getting people used to it, I think will make it very powerful indeed. Laura, I saw you nodding at that point. Yeah, I think, I mean, We've tried on a lot of our projects recently to reuse materials that are there. I use um, raised access floor as a prime example on a project that we've got in at the moment. And I think I think it goes back to that point where we just need to collaborate a bit better. Um, we need to go back to the suppliers and, and get them to understand why we need to, um, especially on the ESG credentials, um, we shouldn't be throwing away um, raised access floor that's okay uh, but it's kind of finding a way to make sure that the um the end user is going to accept it and that there's not going to be a carve out of the lease agreements as well so it's 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 a great idea i think it's brilliant i think if you can actually prove that you've maintained something and it's and it's and it's got more life in it then um we should be definitely exploring it further and i'd be really interested to hear more Rachel personally. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> we've definitely had lots of interest um, amongst our uh, listeners so we've uh, had one question I don't know if people know the answer to this question but uh, he's saying um, embedded carbon in materials depends on the material itself um, mm -hmm. but may differ based on where and how it was manufactured. Are there open source, as in free to use, generic carbon databases available in the UK or globally? It sounds like that that kind of thing is, is very much required. I don't know if it exists or if that's something UKGBC and others are looking at. Um, it 
does exist to a certain point. So the ICE, for example, have um, a database of materials. It is possible to do. Now, I'll admit when we do our body carbon assessments on our projects, we actually use it as a design tool. So to try and help guide the specification and make it as lean as possible, um, we use one-click LCA. So that's sort of a consolidated database of EPDs. So the carbon data that you can use for the calculations comes in the form of an environmental product declaration, which is the third party verified um, document. Now, each manufacturer that has one will hold their own. Um, the issuing authorities probably also have them because you have to be able to verify them online. So, for example, in the UK, the BRE will do it. But I agree, it is a bit haphazard and you end up having to do a lot of digging around, which is why we, we went the route of investing in, um, in one click LCA. But there are... Um, other free to use tools. I know all of the structural engineers have, um, in London, sort of the major practices have developed their own carbon um, measuring tools. And then within the architecture industry, uh, Field and Clegg Bradley Studios and Hawkins Brown have uh, produced two free to use tools that interface with Revit. So um, I don't know if that helps. I, it does sound very helpful and very specific. So, so thank you for talking to that point. Just to widen it out a little bit then, I thought um, there was a, a one remark you made, Simon, that I thought was very interesting, where you said um, there, there are lots of ways that we can improve productivity. And a lot of people talk about MMC, but perhaps that's the last place we should look to make imp productivity improvements. Could you just expand on that, about what, what you meant by that? Did you mean that there are earlier gains that we can make? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I think it's it. If I was going to, if we were going to take the example of the work that Laura and her team are doing on um, Bishop's Gate, that's probably a great example of where lots of those sort of like opportunities, small opportunities, marginal gains to improve productivity, um, will have been tackled, and they'll have been tackled partly because. It's a tower, so you've got to rationalize all your logistics. Also, a lot of the products that are being used there, unitized curtain warning, it's largely manufactured. So there's a lot of stuff there that's being done to address opportunities to improve productivity. And in the same way, going back to something like the, you know, the the INEOS bike cliche that you know you you address every single item of a process or a race to, to get these marginal gains. That's what I'm thinking about we should be doing in construction. And uh, I think one of the greatest characteristics of construction for me is the extent to which actually we don't really plan it quite as well as as other industries do. And um, I, I mean, as an example of this, um, again, going back to the construction sector deal and the work that uh, in particular the um, Construction Innovation Hub were doing, they've done some work on manufacturing quality control planning for construction which i think is the first time this has ever been applied to our industry which is trying to treat um what we do as a manufacturing process and you know you you read it the first time and you say well hang on wait a minute this has got nothing to do with what we do and that actually illustrates precisely why you need to go almost back to first principles of this is how we bring in materials, how we manage labor, how we bring everything together. And if we looked at every one of those steps and thought about, well, how could we make it more productive, then the chances are that we could get massive gains. And it's that sense that we you know, reinvent the process every time we do it, every time we form a team and such like. It really is full of opportunity to, to get better outcomes. Okay, that, um, did, does anyone else want to speak to that point or? I can move on because we have got lots of questions, but I think that's that's a very good general point actually about marginal gains rather than looking for one silver bullet to improve productivity. Um, okay, so um, quite a lot of questions around the role of SMEs in all of this. So we're often looking at sort of cutting edge things or research um, from big big companies like your own, but but how do we how do we get that long tail of the supply chain involved and how do we get productivity up on those sort of those minor works and and improving specification decisions that go all the way down the supply chain does anyone want to speak to the the, the sme part of the the sector i mean i can speak we are an sme 
Um, yeah. I am one person <laughs> in, in a practice of about 70 people. So um, this was, you know, this piece of research on Monteo Passports came about because I was involved in the UK Green Building Council's um, work and I was also working on a project that we had in the office and the client, uh, Grosvenor Estate, um, basically said, okay, off you go. This, this sounds a great idea. Here's a little bit of funding. We match funded and there's three other partners as well that were part of the group. And we really collaborated and we, we went off together and together that sort of four pieces of work um, I think are really meaningful. And it just goes to show what, you know, four separate brains can do um, in pushing something together. and you know, we publish this and it's as open source as we can possibly make it um, because I know I can't do it on my own. So it's just my one thought with my architectural perspective. Uh, so for those who are interested but don't really know where to get started, you know, if you are fortunate to have a UK GBC membership, I would say go there. Um, the networking and the people you'll meet and the conversations that you'll have are brilliant. But there's any number of free events around sustainability in particular that I know of in London. So it's really just seek them out. LinkedIn's a great place to start. Um, and just join these various groups, even if it's just as a listener, and then you spread the word separately. So um, lots of ways that SMEs can get involved, and even just an individual, um, just because realize that you're part of this bigger collective, and your, your voice does um, actually have great effect. Yeah, Laura, when, when you're dealing with um, sort of suppliers and smaller firms, how, how do you feel that the um information and knowledge is shared and is it is it is it done in the best way maybe i think rachel hit the nail on the head really it's it's not one person that's going to be able to solve this problem um it needs to be a collaborated effort i know i've said that a lot today i don't know if that's i don't know if that's coming across but um but it's something um we are now having to write into our contracts is that we need to know where things are coming from because we need to build a ESG portfolio for a asset. So, but we're very fortunate that we do work with, um, we, but we pride ourselves in construction management. So we do, we tend to work with um, the supply chain, but we also are very clear in our messaging on what we need because we don't want people wasting time on things that isn't relevant to us. We don't, we don't want 50 pages of reports. We want the data that we need. So it's kind of, it's, it's working in that circle and making sure that every stakeholder understands what, each other needs out of the process because i think sometimes it can get lost in translation a little bit um i'm not sure if you agree with that one rachel but i think no, it's, just, it's just got to be a very clear message on what what we require to be able to report essentially um is that of, saying you were building into your contracts are you building in sort of collaboration clauses in there <laughs> yeah well there's that there's always been collaboration clauses. It's more to it's more towards um, ESG um, reporting, essentially. So, um, I think I've mentioned in my five minute overview is that we're we're seeing the projects starting to. Um, it's not just construction. It's not we're just not there for design and construction anymore. We're seeing the construction teams be retained post contract so that we can make sure the building is working in the way that it needs to, especially from an energy perspective. So I think the next kind of five years, I think it's going to really come into the fruition because people are going to need to be accountable for what they're building and not just after defects and walk away. Um, so it's actually accountability issue that could be the real game changer here that if, if you're suddenly accountable for the building post completion in some way or other you're going to be much more you're going to want to be involved at a much earlier stage to make sure <laughs> it's built yeah. and that's I, I think design for performance and neighbors um, is is kind of is a big big thing in the london market at the moment and it's something that's kind of um it's going to hold people accountable um, because it and, it and it needs to. So we need to make sure the buildings are working as they're designed and not just forgotten about and and refurbished in 20 years time. Absolutely. Uh, one other question, actually, I think that's probably uh, well um, 
it would be good to put to you, Laura, uh, from uh, a listener who's been asking around, um, obviously, the, the wanting to avoid repeated mistakes or repeated inefficiencies or allocation of tasks and things. And and his, I think his point is, uh, how much does the constraint of the site play into that? So as a sort of developer focused on, I assume, quite tight sites, in the capital, does that does that feed into it? You know the constraints. And you are you. If you're working in London, you're generally going to be constrained at some point, right? What it's small sites. So, however, that said, is that it's it's important to learn the lessons. I think, and um, we really spend a lot of time on making sure our kind of our sites are set up well logistically to be able to allow people to do their jobs essentially. Um, and it's not something we just do at the start of the project. We have continuous continuous reviews on site to make sure that the site is set up and getting the most efficient um, processes out of it um, and that's fed back to all of the um, ops teams back at Stanhope we have regular reviews on kind of how all of our sites and if there's some clever ideas that are coming up um, we'll, we'll discuss it as a team and see whether we should implement it across the board. Okay um, thank you well, look, I think we're, we've probably um, got through most of the questions um, that have come through but um, I just want to um, end off by asking you each if there's one thing that would be like your pet thing to improve productivity in this industry or like top of your wish list perhaps what would it be um i might pick up simon first <laughs> as you went first in your presentation. I'm, I'm i'm going to go back to that theme of treating labor and materials as a precious resource and um one example of that would be thinking about our employment model. Forty percent of our of our people in the industry are self-employed. They're not invested in. And, and so I think if I have one pet thing, it would be to have a directly employed, invested labour force who are then motivated to treat materials and resources very preciously. Wonderful. Very succinctly put. Laura, can I go to you next? talk to each other I think it's one of my biggest frustrations as a client uh, and a developer is that um, communication is key to success if there's a problem get it on the table and talk about it wonderful okay so openness transparency communication all of those things really matter when it comes to productivity Rachel not so much productivity, but just in general, realize your sphere of influence and um, use it wisely. So I can do more damage in a morning's worth of specifications as an individual than my company will do, and we have the numbers to prove it, will do in an entire year in terms of our own company corporate carbon footprint. And um, so understanding your impact taking a step back and saying is it the fire door is there a supplier i can speak to that one voice um actually goes a really long way so use that and on each project we try to do one what we call deep assignment so try and innovate or push research or test something new one thing on every project um, and i think if we all took that approach we'd have a lot of really interesting ideas and conversations to share Wonderful. Um, Rachel, I've had one person just come back and uh, just with a plea to share links to those databases that you mentioned. So I don't know if maybe on social media when you post about this, you could maybe share a couple of links for people and then they, they can look out for your social posts. That's probably I will have a look or you'll find me on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. So reach out to me, message me on LinkedIn and I might send, I'm not sure the rest of LinkedIn want to see a list of databases. No, <laughs> no. But yeah. Um, uh, reach out to me and I'll see how I can help. No, that's great. I think what's really encouraging is to see that the, the people who are registered to this webinar are really keen to find out more and are really keen to improve 
productivity rates and to uh, find out and share information. So that's really encouraging and a really encouraging note to end on. So um, just as a quick reminder, if um, if you do want to go back to any of the points made in this webinar, this will be available on demand. So if uh, if Rachel did scoot through some links, you might uh, pick them up again if you listen listen again carefully. Um, but also for colleagues who might have um, missed today's uh, chat. Um, also that this is part of a whole day on um, digital um, uh, buildings, our digital building series. So we have we had a session early this morning that you can get on catch up and we've got a session again at 2 p.m. So don't miss that. Do come back to the website for that. Um, but for now, I'd just like to thank Simon, Laura and Rachel for their time and their brilliant presentations. And um, hope to see you all again soon. Um, so thanks again very much and goodbye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.